Um, today, we're going to be talking about the passage where Jesus comes the storm in Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41. And we're continuing our series in the book of Mark. And this is perhaps one of the most misinterpreted passages in the Bible because it's often used as an inspirational story to get over your fear or some raw, raw thing to get your faith up and see miracles in your life. But I would like to actually propose that this passage is not necessarily about Jesus calming the storm. Or rather, it's not about Jesus calming the storms in your life. I would like to propose that this is actually Mark's way of highlighting Jesus' sovereignty. And in Jesus showing that he is sovereign, he gives us the faith to get through our storms. Can I get an amen? Right? If we get the order of that incorrect, we really reduce the power of this passage. If we first make it about the miracles and him calming our storms, then we really reduce the effectiveness of this passage. But when we first make it about Jesus' sovereignty, his deity, and his power, in that, we see that we have faith to face tomorrow. And so the title of my message today is When Faith Becomes History. And I, you know, I was trying to get creative with it, you know. I was deep in my poetry bag. I was like, God, what's going to be my YouTube uh, click, clicker, you know, sermon title? And I really felt like when faith becomes history was not just clickbait. It's, 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 it's to capture this idea that God is focused on making our fear a part of our past. But also, he wants to tap into your fear so that it becomes a strength for your future. See, Bill Johnson, he once said, I can lay hands on you. I could pray for you. I can impart gifts upon you. But one thing I cannot give you is history. You will never know the moments of joy, the moments of sadness, the moments that I was on my knees, the moments that I was crying with community, the moments that I was rejoicing. You'll never know these intimate moments that I've had with Jesus. I can't give those things to you. I can give you good teaching, good theology. I could pray for you. I might even be able to impart a gift upon you, but I can't give you my history with Jesus. And I'd like to propose that Jesus is interested in not just making your fear a part of your past. He's interested in making it a part of your story. He's interested in making a part of your testimony, a part of your victory, and interested in making fear a part of history. And so with that being said, let's go straight into the passage, Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. It says, on that day when evening came, Jesus said to them, let us go over to the other side. A little bit of context here. Jesus was on a boat teaching the crowd. And we know that in this part of the Sea of Galilee, there was like a little bit of a natural amphitheater effect. He didn't necessarily need to yell and raise his voice that loudly in order, to, in order for all 5,000 people to hear him. Due to the geography and all of these things, it just carried his voice. And so he would be on a boat in the waters, and the crowds would be on the shores. And he's teaching and teaching and healing and all of these things. And it says, on that day, he said, let's go over to the other side to his disciples. Leaving the crowd, the disciples took Jesus along with them on, in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? There's, there's just, this passage is so deep. There's just so much brilliance going on in this small little passage. But I really feel like Mark is highlighting two things for us today. And I think that he's trying to demonstrate in this passage that Jesus cares and that Jesus can. I think that the most important thing that is highlighted through repetition, certain phrases that he's starting to repeat in the Greek, he's trying to show that Jesus can calm the storm. 
highlighting his deity, highlighting his sovereignty, his, his power, and that Jesus does care. And so those are the two points that I want us to deep, uh, dig deeper into today. The first part is this. I don't know if you've noticed, but in this passage, it's a very tight story, right? There's not a lot of words. It's not long-winded. But even still, commentators will say that this passage includes a lot of unnecessary detail. Even though Mark, I thought Mark was using extreme economy of language and just a few words to capture such an amazing story. Because if I was a disciple and I saw this miracle, I would embellish this story. I'll be like, dog, it was crazy. There were at least one million people on the shores. 30,000 boats, an armada. Listen, right? And I was just, I would just go all out, right? And like this storm, oh man, it had a demon in it, right? Like all of this stuff. And I would go all out. I would embellish, but Mark is very tight with his language. Yet, even still, commentators say there's unnecessary detail. For example, if we could go to the slide that shows the unnecessary detail. It says that he was on the, he was on the uh, sea and there were other boats there with him. And it also says that he was in the stern. And it also says that it, they took him as he was. And it also says that he slept on a cushion. And I was like, you know what? These unnecessary details, I think there's a... In preparation of this message, I was like, oh, why was he on a cushion? Why did Mark write that he was on a cushion? And all these different blogs were like, you know, Jesus was human too. He wanted natural comforts, blah, 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 blah. And then other historians would be like, actually, all boats had a cushion on the stern. That's just what it was, right? And I was like, man, what is, all, what is up with all of these unnecessary details? And, oh, man, the most brilliant teacher of them all, Tim Keller, he says, legends in ancient times would have no unnecessary details. It was bare bone, skeleton facts. They got straight to the point, included no fluff. But this passage has fluff. It has unnecessary details. And this shows us that it is not a legend. It is not a made-up story. It's not just some grand tale the disciples told in order to increase the mythos around Jesus. This is, has all of the hallmarks of a real account. This has all of the details of a personal account. That when Mark was putting this story together, this passage together, he was actually getting real testimony, real eyewitness accounts from people. And they were the ones including these unnecessary details. Oh, they didn't even give him time to change. He they took him as he was. Oh, there were other boats around him. Oh, he was on the cushion. He was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. Right? I could imagine maybe some of the other disciples out of bitterness included that detail. Like, oh man, we were on the top working hard, rowing bitterly, and he was on the cushion. Right? I don't know. But he, it, this story has all of the hallmarks of a real account. And the reason why I want to hammer in on this is that Mark is trying to highlight the point, God can. He's trying to highlight the point that Jesus can. See, a lot of the times we might think that Jesus is unable. We might look at the disciples in this passage, you know, getting a stern talking to when Jesus later goes up to them and says, do you still have no faith? Why are you so afraid? And it's easy for us in our comfy, you know, Bible study and be like, these disciples, so foolish. When in reality, every single one of us make the same mistake that they made every single day of our lives. I know I do. I know for a fact I'm the biggest scaredy cat. I, constantly, God calls me to do things and I'm so afraid. I live with fear constantly in my life. And some of you who might say, oh, I don't really struggle with fear. I don't really have struggle with anxiety. Well, maybe that's because you've already adjusted your life to accommodate the fear. And so now you don't actually feel fear, but your life is governed and, and dictated by fear. 
I know some people, they, they don't drive on the freeway because they're afraid of the freeway. And I go, hey, do you have any fears in your life? They're like, no, I don't really live with fear. I'm very, I'm happy and peaceful all the days of my life. Okay, then why does it take you an hour to go from Buena Park to Fullerton, right? Like, just get on the 91, right? And they're like, no, I'd never drive on the freeway. See, they don't live with fear, but they've already allowed fear to govern their lives and adjust the way that they live. You might say, no, I don't, I don't really have a lot of fear. Well, that's very easy for someone to say when they don't live with a lot of faith. When you don't take a lot of risk. When you've already adjusted your life to calculate fear out of the equation. But when God is calling us to live according to his ways and to follow in his footsteps, fear becomes a part of the calculus. And when it is so, God is trying to demonstrate I can. See, I struggle with that idea a lot. Can he really fix the problems in my marriage? You know, I recognize a lot of people in this room might not be married, and some are. And so if this analogy helps, amen. If it doesn't, in the future, it might. I love my wife, and I'm convinced in my heart of hearts that she is the one for me and that God has placed her in my life and there's no one else for me. But there are days where we just grind each other's gears to the point where it's like, surely not her, God. <laughs> and I'm sure in her mind, she's also like, I know for a fact it's not him, Lord, right? And it's like we can get into the fiercest of fights. And it's like, no way, Jose. And in those moments, I'm like, God, there's no way you can fix this. There's no way. And you know, some time passes. She eats a meal. I get, a, I get some coffee. And <laughs> turns out everything's fine, right? She was just hangry and I was decaffeinated. And we just love each other once again so much more. And, it's, and we're holding hands and we're like, what was that? I don't know. That was crazy. We're dysfunctional, but we're going to get to the bottom of this. And sometimes I look at God and I'm like, how? Are you really able? Sometimes we look at our lives in terms of career, in terms of friendships, in terms of our own dysfunction. I know I look at, I do a heart check regularly and I'm, I pop the hood of my soul and I'm like, there's no engine. The transmission is missing. The oil is, it's gone. It's running on milk. It's like, it's okay. I don't know why I said that, but it's just to point out I'm like, why is there so much addiction? Why is there so much anger? Why are there so much insecurity and dysfunction? And when I pop the hood of my soul, I say, God, surely you can't fix all of this. When I pop the hood of my soul, I say, surely you can't love this mess. And what Mark is trying to highlight by pointing out that God can even calm the storms is that, yes, God can. See, there's a war in society right now. In modern culture, I don't know if you guys know this, but America is already a post-Christian nation. See, a lot of people are trying to say, oh my God, the church is declining. How are we going to rebuild the church in America? How are we going to fix? Hey, y'all, it's already done. We're in a post-Christian nation already. See, there was a time in, in the Roman Empire where it became a Christian empire. And then afterwards, Europe became secularized. And now Christians need to understand how to operate in a post-Christian society, right? You have to understand how to function when your nation is Christian majority and when its nation is Christian minority. And right now, we're in a post-Christian state. And there, there's a culture war. And the culture is trying to say, faith does not work. Prayer does not work. Your religion is escapism. Just because you can't handle the harsh realities of this world, you're trying to kumbaya yourself into some kind of self-help therapy, thinking that Jesus is going to rub your back into sleep, and you aren't able to handle the harsh realities of, of, of this life. And what God is trying to tell us is this. Prayer does work. Faith still moves, and God can. God can. See, what we see here is that God is able to calm the storms. The thing that is so distorted about the teaching usually around this passage is that God will calm your storm. 
our comfort from this passage does not come from the fact that God will calm our storm. It comes from the fact that our lives are in the hands of a sovereign God who can calm the storm. Our comfort, our encouragement does not come from a peaceful, problem-free life. It comes from a life that is in Jesus' hands who is sovereign. God can. If you turn this passage into some kind of get your faith up and claim it and it's a miracle for you, it will create so much hurt in so many believers that are saying, I believed, I prayed, how come there is no miracle for me? Does God not really love me? Do I really not believe enough? Am I supposed to get even more desperate? And it misses out on the truth that if we recognize that we are in God's hands, God can. And we recognize that. And I believe that God was trying to teach that to the disciples in a way that only they would know. For some of <laughs> that only God is able to control the weather. See, up until this point, in the book of Mark 1, 2, 3, and 4, God, Jesus is performing a lot of miracles, casting out demons and all of these things. But you know what the number one criticism of this is? And this was actually a fact in the 80s. A lot of atheists would criticize Jesus and be like, oh, that was just placebo effect. Oh, that, you know, there were some atheists that said Jesus was a hypnotist. Oh, he just hypnotized these people into thinking that they were, you know, no longer sick or no longer deaf or no longer blind. Or he hypnotized or he did a placebo effect or demons, come on. It's just mentally dysfunctional people and he just set them straight. It's like he just did that. And really what Mark is trying to show is that in this miracle, God is the God of the storms and the winds and the waves. And that God is able to... Um, even calm these supernatural things in nature, which is the realm that only God is able to do. And we see that in Psalms, it says multiple things like only you, God, there is none like you for who can calm the storms, who can calm the waters, all these different passages. But one passage that I got really struck by in my research for this was in Psalms chapter 107. If we, can, if we can actually pull up Psalms chapter 107 onto the screen right there so that we can all see that. It actually shows a passage where sailors are on the sea in the ship and that God is the one who is able to calm the storm. It says, some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths, right? That's poetry, metaphor for how high and how deep the waves were. Trying to use hyperbolic language to show it was an immense storm. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. See, these sailors, they knew the word because they grew up in that Jewish culture. And as they saw Jesus calm the storm, I'm assuming that all of these passages regarding the, the storm, the sea, God calming the winds, went through their mind and they said, surely Jesus is God. See, a lot of biblical critics will say that, you know, Jesus being divine, we don't really know that. Only the book of John shows that Jesus is divine. Mark makes no claim. Matthew makes no claim. Luke makes no claim to Jesus' divinity. But in here we see that Mark makes allusions to the Old Testament to connect prophecies to show that Jesus truly is the God, the deity of God. And so what I'm trying to highlight for us today is that God can and that God is able and that Jesus is God. And the next thing that I really want to highlight 
is that God cares. One thing that we see is that the disciples go up to Jesus and they're, the way they wake him up, they say, do you not care that we perish? Do you not care that we perish? And it says that Jesus goes out, he goes to the storm, he tells it to hush, to shut up, to be quiet, and then he goes back to them and he says, do you still have no faith? Whew, to me, that word still, it's scathing. If I were to hear Jesus go, oh, do you have no faith? I'd be like, oh, yeah, sorry, Jesus, I got I to gotta get my faith up, right? But he goes, do you still have no faith? I'm like, oh, why do you have to put the still? I think Jesus is trying to, to draw up this idea in the disciples, like, after everything that I've done for you, after everything that I've shown you from, from when I called you till now, do you still not trust me? The best way we could kind of translate the word, piss this, the word faith is, is trust, loyalty. Do you still not trust me? And we see Jesus is trying to evoke inside of them kind of like a, a memory reel, right? I, I, th I think I'm reading into the scriptures a little bit right here, but I imagine when he says, do you still not trust me? Jesus is like, I could, have, I could have called the most brilliant disciples from the, from the rabbinical schools, but I called you a tax collector. I called you a fisherman. I called you a former rebel, revolutionary. I called you all of these random ragtag group of people who had no right to follow a great leader. I chose you to be my 12. Jesus is trying to highlight, I care for you. I still care for you. And I imagine Jesus maybe, maybe got a little bit of a hurt when they woke him up and they were like, do you not care for us? I remember one time uh, my wife, she, she was in an emergency. I'm not, just long story short, she was in an emergency. I dropped the ball badly, okay? I, didn't, I wasn't able to fix the emergency. And I disappointed her gravely. Totally my fault, 100%. And I remember in our discussion, our debrief, I'm like, hey, babe, I'm so sorry. Like, are, are we good, right? Can you forgive me? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I could forgive you. I'm not mad at you anymore. And I was like, okay, oh, thank you. Praise God, right? And then I go, like, how do we prevent this in the future? How do we not fight like this in the future? And she looked at me and she's like, if I'm being real, I was like, maybe not too real, but yeah, sure. She's like, if I could be real, I was like, okay. She's like, I just think I can't expect from you. I was like, oh, oh. As, a, as, as a man, I was just like, oh, right? And I looked at her and I'm like, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> it cut me deeply. And as I looked at my wife, I want her to be able to look at me with confidence. I want her to be able to look at me with trust and to know that I could be there for her. But we had a real, a real conversation. I was like, you know what? I am man and I'm going to fail. I have limitations. But if you can trust in me and you can expect of me and you can have faith in me knowing that I still have my limitations, that would be deeply appreciated. <laughs> And this just made me appreciate even more that God has no limitations, that Jesus has no limitations. And this is, this is really the crux of the message that I wish we could highlight today. I believe that the source of our fear isn't, it's not that Jesus isn't with us. We know Jesus is with us. A lot of believers who follow Jesus, they know that God loves them. They know that God is with them and all of these things. But the source of the fear, because Christians are still some of the most fearful people. The source of the fear in reality is that we don't genuinely believe that he cares. Yeah, at, on the surface level, we're like, yeah, God can do all things. Yeah, I know that he loves me. But deep down inside, I'm not really sure that he loves me. I'm not really sure that he cares for the details of my life. I don't really believe that he cares. And it reminds me of a story of John Wesley. He was the founder of the Methodist denomination. 
he, uh, he was coming on the boat from England. And on that boat were a group of Germanic believers named the Moravians. And they were in a conversation. And John Wesley, he speaks to the Moravians. And these are some really intense, hardcore believers, right? They had like a hundred years long prayer movement, all of this stuff. And they lo- one of the Moravians looked at John Wesley and was like, do you know Jesus? And John Wesley says, I know Jesus died for my sins. And then the Moravian looks at him and he goes, no, do you know Jesus? And John Wesley goes, I hope he has died for my sins. And then the Moravian looks at him again and says, do you know Jesus? And John Wesley says that he breaks down on that boat weeping. And he says, no, I don't know him fully. I know, and then it says in his own journal, in John Wesley's journal entry, it says, I reflected on this moment and I had a fair weather religion. Yes, I, I knew a great deal about God. Yes, I knew a, a, a good amount of religion and, and the right things to say. But when, when the, I'm going to misquote him, but it says, when my soul perishes and my spirit is upon the shores of eternity, I fear still. I do not know Jesus. And I think that what, what this story is trying to really get at is not just know on an intellectual level, but in Hebrew, the word know means yada, means to really intimately understand and really thoroughly to the deepest core of your heart, believe and trust in this thing. See, many of us might have a fair weather religion But when it really comes down to it, we don't really trust that Jesus cares for us and has our best interest in our hearts. And that's why when a storm comes in our life, our faith disappears. Because we don't believe that Jesus cares for us when waters get troubled. We're not really confident in the fact that we can have peace even in the midst of a storm. Our faith is determined by how fair the weather is, not how near Jesus is. And so I would like to propose today that if we can really overcome our fear, it's not by gaslighting ourselves. It's not by brainwashing ourselves and just chanting these things over and over again. I think it's to really get at the source of our fear. And the source of our fear is that we do not, at some part of our subconscious level, believe that either God can fix the things in our lives or that he doesn't care about moving in our lives or that he doesn't care about our good. See, the reality of this is Jesus is calling us to go into these storms. See, the irony is this. In the beginning of the passage, it wasn't the disciples' ideas. Let's go over to the other side. It was Jesus' idea. He looked at the disciples, and he was like, okay, y'all, I've been preaching for about a day and a half now. I could just tell in my, you know, omniscience and my spiritual foreknowledge, there's a storm coming. I killed enough time. Let's go. We're going to coincide in the middle of the waters at the perfect time when the storm comes. Right. I used to have, I, I, one time I had a, a missions leader, right. He would be like, Hey, we have two hours until lunch is ready. You need to, you need to just preach and kill time. So he would just have us preach for like two hours. Right. Until lunch was ready. And I'll be like, right when we're about to pray, he's like, all right, food's ready. Let's go. You killed enough time. Right. And I'm not saying this is what Jesus did, but maybe cause he was teaching for a long time. And Finally, they go out into the waters, and the storm perfectly coincides at that time. I really believe Jesus set this all up. Because in the next, next chapter, chapter 6, we see that Jesus sends the disciples out two by two. He sends the 12 out. Now, I don't know if you've seen the show Chosen, where it follows Jesus' life, and it, it does like a theatrical depiction of the Gospels. This moment, it, it breaks my heart. Jesus sits the 12 down, and he's like, all right, guys. Don't take anything. Go to the villages two by two. And they're freaking out. They're like, what do you mean? And then he tells them, you know, preach and heal. And then my favorite part is in, the, in this show, like one of the disciples, they look at Jesus like, I have the ability to heal? 
right? Like, it's amazing. But I really do believe that before Jesus was able to send these disciples out, he knew that in some part of their hearts, they didn't really believe that he cared. That he had to set this moment up, that he had to send them into the storm in order to show his sovereignty before them. I don't know, I don't know where your theology might be. I don't know what your understanding of suffering and Jesus m- might be right now. But if I'm the first person to break this news to you, I pray that you receive this with love and with grace and that it doesn't come off as, as judgment and condemnation or anything like that. But I would like to tell you this, that life is full of suffering and following Jesus isn't about making that suffering go away. It's about finding his joy, his love, his grace, his presence in the midst of that suffering. And the miracle isn't that the storms of this life go away. The miracle is that you and I are now now not bothered by it. The greater miracle than the natural is is the spiritual change. It's finally that anxiety ridden people, fear driven people, can now face the storm head on and say, yes, I'm scared, but it's not going to destroy me. You know, I love this one preacher. He says, the devil knows, right? I'm, I don't really want to conflate it with this passage because there's no real ex- ex- um, evidence that this passage is about demonic warfare. But he loves to say, the devil knows that the storms in this life can't take you out. Your fear is going to take you out. And that's why he amplifies the fear in your mind. The thing that's going to take you out in this life is your own perception of the storms of this life. And so Jesus makes it a moment, makes it his magnum opus in all of the miracles in this book and says, the thing that I need to work on the most is taking the fear out of the disciples' hearts. To know that they are cared for by a God who can. And so what we see here is Jesus is trying to demonstrate for you and me, I'm sovereign. Yes, this passage is not about Jesus calming the storms of our lives, but it's the fact that he can, and our lives are in the hands of a God who can. I know I'm reiterating that, and I sound like a broken record, but I I need to really hammer in on that point because it's so easy to make this about God fix my life. It's not fix my life. It's fix my eyes on you. And so one thing that I'd like to close out with, there's a song that actually written back in the day that has to do with this passage where it says, sometimes Jesus calms the storm. And the song goes like this. Sometimes he calms the storm with a whispered peace be still. He can settle any sea but it doesn't mean he will. Sometimes he holds us close and lets the wind and waves go wild. Sometimes he calms the storm and other times he calms his child. I'd like for the praise team to come up right now. In this moment, I would actually like to do a little heart check on ourselves and see God, where is the source of all my fear and anxiety in my life? And for some of you who might say, I don't really feel, feel fear and anxiety all that much in my life. I would like to ask you, have you already adjusted your life to live in accommodation of fear? That you avoid and you naturally just don't go towards the things that the Lord has been calling you towards because you're accommodating the fear. If that's so, I'd like for us to ask ourselves, where is the source of it? Is it because at some parts we don't believe he can? Because I struggle with that all the time in my marriage. I say, God, can you really do this? I think about that in my career as well. I say, God, are you really calling me to plant a church? My pastor is telling me every week that it's impossible. (laughs) It's crazy hard. It's so difficult. And I'm like, I know, I know. And I, I wonder, God, can you really? And I really believe that God is trying to go against the cultural messages of today and saying faith doesn't work, prayer doesn't work, but it does. And God can, for the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you in Ephesians 1.19. And also it says in John 13, verily I tell you, far greater will you do than the works that I have done. 
that that power lives in us. It's still alive today. That this religion that we believe in is real. That this power hasn't just gone away 2,000 years ago. That this faith is not just good teaching. It's not just moralism. It's not just escapism. It's actual power given to you and me. Perhaps not power to calm the storms because that's not what it's about. But power to survive the storms. See, Jesus sent them into the storm intentionally because he knew it's not your job to fix the storm. It's your job to survive the storm. Just don't let it take you out. For in James it says that if you resist the devil for a time, he will flee. In your heart, do you believe that he can? Or perhaps in your heart, do you believe that he cares? Yeah, God, I know that you're God. But there's no way you see someone as small as me. There's no way you see someone as sinful as me. There's no way that... There's no way that you could use me again after all of the mistakes that I've made. I know that you don't take take the anointing or the Holy Spirit away, but it sure does feel like you should take the anointing away from me, from the amount of times that I've disappointed you, from the amount of times that I've let you down. So in this moment, do you believe that God can? And do you believe that God cares? I'd like for us to all stand up right now and I'll just close out with one last story. As to, I remember when I was in ninth grade, um, at this time I was living by myself. My dad had passed away when I was in seventh grade and my mom moved to Korea and my sister was off in college and I was actually living in an apartment by myself. And I remember one day my sister came to visit from college like once every month. She came to visit me and she sat me down and she said, Jimmy, our family is actually being sued by the Korean government for $2 million. And I just, I got like a gut punch. And I was like, okay, do we have $2 million? And she looked at me and like, are you dumb? No. And I thought we were going to go broke. I thought our family was done for. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to have any money to go to college. And my mom would always tell me, you need to go to college or you're not going to get a job. And if you don't get a job, then you're going to end up on the streets and you're going to like, you know, just be in trouble and all of that stuff. And so my mind, I started to panic. I started to fear. I started to just spiral out of control. And I remember as, before my sister, I was on my knees bawling and weeping in ninth grade. And I don't know if I was crying for five minutes or for one hour, but it felt like forever. And finally, I look up through my watery eyes it's all blurry I look at my sister and she's unfazed she's like no emotion and I look at her and I'm like I say Nuna which means older sister in Korea. I was like aren't you scared and she just looks me dead in my eyes and she says don't you know that God is sovereign I don't know how our life is going to turn out I don't know how all of these situations are going to play out but he works everything for the good of those who love him. And I would like to just, I would like to just highlight for us today. May your peace, may your faith not come from the fact that your life is stormless or problemless, but may your peace come from the fact that God is sovereign and he's working all things for the good of those who love him. And that in the midst of your storms, in the midst of your problems, that you are safe. That though he might not work every detail in your life according to your definition of what is good, according to what your definition of success or your definition of enrichment and fulfillment might be, in reality, his definition of your good is far better than anything you could have ever imagined. That I would like to propose that God can. And in the moment right now, he's not interested in you getting to the other side. He's interested in getting the fear out of your life in the midst of the storm 
See, I love getting to the other side. Don't get me wrong. I love a happy ending. But what I love more after years of following Jesus is in the midst of the storm, when I'm broken, when I'm tired, when I'm afraid, that I get on my knees and I feel Jesus' presence near than ever before because Jesus is closer in the, in, the, in the thrones of my enemies, in the valleys, than ever in the, the valley top, in the mountain top, than in the good places. I know that Jesus is closer. So right now, can you just close your eyes right now? And in this moment, let us confess freely. Just as the disciples confessed freely to Jesus, do you even care that I perish? See, I don't think that the disciples were rebuked for saying this passage for saying this line. God wanted them to say this line so that it could be an opportunity where he could override their fear and place his sovereignty in that midst to allow a moment that they were afraid of the storms to become a moment where they now fear the Lord above all else, which gives them courage for all the days until the end for their fear to become history. Let's pray right now, church, and just lift up your heart and say god do you even care about me i present to you my fears i present to you my worries my marriage my career my dysfunction my addiction my insecurity can you fix this do you care jesus and as you just lift that up right now i'm going to invite the praise team to close this out in worship